Take it away, Charlie. Amazing. Thanks so much, JP. Um, as JP has already highlighted, today we are looking to talk through the implementation plan, which is basically the agreement that has come out of COP. Hopefully, many of you were able to see our interviews that Climate Talk was doing over the two weeks we were there. And whilst we were mainly focusing on civil society and what different groups were doing at COP and speaking to young people, um, Alicia and Namge were really doing the hard work in the negotiations room, getting us to this final agreement, which today we're going to look over and really just have a chat about what is in there, why is it significant, what is missing, um, and really how this agreement moves us forward. So first of all, let me introduce Climate Talk, which is one of the events co-hosting uh, today. So Climate Talk is a youth-led non-for-profit which aims to educate young people about the climate crisis and also amplify young people's voices. So we create content through articles, um, videos like the interviews we were doing during COP, really to just demystify the climate movement, break down a lot of this UN language and um, barriers like that so that young people can get engaged in the climate movement and have their voice heard because we need to have a role in climate policy, decision-making, um, a role in spaces like COP, and that is what Climate Talk aims to do. And also events like the one that you are attending today, which will hopefully also be very useful to people who might want to get involved in COP in the future or generally learn about what this process is all about. I'll pass on to Alicia and Namge to introduce themselves um, and maybe also what you were doing at COP. Also, Alicia, if I come to you first and you can also explain uh, about the CYMP, what this program is, and um, what, what this program is doing at COP. Sure, thanks Charlie for the invitation. So first to introduce CYMP, it's the Climate Youth Negotiators Program. This is a global intergenerational program that is aimed at redressing the systemic inequality of youth representation in negotiations and decision-making and overcoming youth washing and tokenism by tackling the root causes and driving system change to ensure long-term meaningful youth participation in multilateral decision-making. So this program was launched this year and for its first cohort, the CYMP has signed MOUs with 27 countries from all UN regions that are part of the CYMP. And uh, CYMP has trained 58 young people who, who were the official negotiators for their countries at COP27. Wow, brilliant. Thank you for uh, explaining the CYMP so succinctly, this amazing program. Um, if you'd like to maybe then go on and speak about, Alicia, what you were doing at uh, COP, what your role was, what, what you were tracking. Evelyn, I see you've come into the uh, chat as well. Evelyn is our third panellist today. So um, we'll just go around and, if, as I say, if each of you could talk about what you were doing at COP and um, the, the topic that you were tracking. Alicia, if you want to go first. Sure. Uh, so uh, I was part of the Peruvian delegation. And the topic I was assigned was, well, well, there were two topics, uh, the mitigation work program and the second periodic review. So this is mitigation related program um, uh, agenda items. And and yeah, those were, were the ones that I were, was following. And also I had, uh, I supported a bit in the round tables of mitigation at the Global Stock Take. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, Namge, if you'd like to go next. Hi everyone, um, so great to see you all again. Uh, we had two very intense weeks at COP and honestly, I'm still recovering from it. Uh, my name is Namge Chodin for everyone else and I'm from Bhutan. Um, as all of you might have figured out by now, we all went as um, party delegates representing our own governments. Um, I followed only the Article 6 track, which is on... Uh, so in the Paris text, it's called cooperative approaches, right? Um, the term markets or carbon markets, it's not mentioned everywhere, anywhere, uh, but um, it is um, on carbon markets. And I'd be happy to speak about some of the progress that we made there. Um, so that is really the only topic that I followed. It's highly technical. It's quite intense. And um, it was... Uh, really an intense and amazing experience. I feel like Article 6 is one that always scares people because of how technical it is, but I know from past experience that you're very good at breaking down and explaining it in very simple terms, as you had to do to me a couple of times during COP. <laughs> so yes, thank you. And uh, we look forward to that update. Um, Evelyn, if we could also hear from you the topic you were tracking and, and what you were doing at COP. 
Hi, everyone. It's so nice to meet you. Um, once again, I mean, I'm gay, Alicia. It's been so long <laughs> already. So um, at COP, I was with the Ghana delegation. I was following loss and damage um, mostly. So I followed all the tracks under loss and damage. Um, the operationalization of the Santiago network and then plus and damage funding and also on the WMSCOM reports. And then I tried to follow this as well, but I went to just a few of the meetings because loss and damage was already cut. Um, so that was, those were the tracks I was following. Um, yeah. And then I was part of the CYMP and it's so nice seeing you all. I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you, Jam. Yeah, I feel like you set yourself a big challenge tracking two topics, both loss and damage and ACE, especially with loss and damage being such a key point of this summit's uh, negotiations. So, and a key part of the agreement that we're going to talk about today. So I'm really looking forward to your insights and telling us what it was like reaching this, reaching this agreement. Uh, I think first, if we maybe have a short discussion about your experience as negotiators before we go into the agreement itself. So my first question to you all is, was the experience of being a youth negotiator as you had imagined it would be? I know you went through this long training process culminating in this in-person uh, negotiation simulation led by Ian Fry, the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the context of climate change, which is an amazing opportunity. But you know, tell us, was it like you thought it would be? Can, can anything prepare you for being in that room and, and taking part in the negotiations? Um, Namge, if you'd like to give us your thoughts first. Sure. Uh, so first of all, I think one of the most meaningful ways that young people can participate in a process like the COP is really to get a seat at the negotiations. And um, I know that it is very complex and we're all quite lucky that uh, you know our governments reached out to us to be onboarded in the really wonderful um, climate youth negotiators program and you know with that also comes a lot of guidance um, this was my first COP and a lot of people said they were absolutely lost but uh, they were absolutely lost in their first COP but for me to be frank I really did not feel that way I felt like I knew what was going on um, so that's all thanks to the climate youth negotiators program so shout out to all the amazing um, founders and creators and supporters of the program but um, anyway so my experience as a youth negotiator um, you know I in the beginning, I thought that, you know, me being uh, uh, someone from a developing country, me being a young person, me being a woman at the intersection of all these different identities, I thought it was a huge privilege for me to be in the negotiation rooms. But as the days wore on, I realized that I needed to reframe that. Um, it's not a privilege, but rather it's necessary that someone like me is there representing the concerns and aspirations of people of my generation, firstly, of all the young people that I came there representing. And secondly, uh, coming from a least developed country uh, such as Bhutan, I realized that it's important for me to be there to have our concerns and our barriers in sometimes very complex processes be heard and be considered. Uh, so I, as I mentioned previously, I followed the article six, which is on the cooperative approaches. And at the end of um, the, the COP, I feel like I have a much um, better and nuanced understanding of what the matter is. And I think the way I find myself uh, talking about the issue and also explaining it uh, to others has um, really improved. And I think that is a sign that I've gained a better understanding of the issue. Um, and I'll keep it at here. Maybe we can like get onto it later because I think once I start talking, people just like glaze over it because it can get quite um, technical, but you know, no worries. I'll try to break it down and make it as simple as possible. And uh, I'll stop it here. Yeah, and then pass it on to the others. 
Yeah, thank you. I think you make some really good points. First of all, I think it really speaks to the CYMP that you weren't feeling super lost at your first cult. Because I know last year in Glasgow, I didn't know what was going on. So um, <laughs> they really have changed up well. But I think that's also um, interesting how you say, even though you did feel familiar with the process, that you then became more familiar with your topic and talking about Article 6, which I feel like is one of those things that you only can really gain from experience of actually being there and talking about it and being in the room. Um, Evelyn, if we come to you next, maybe um, your thoughts on how the actual experience of being a negotiator was different to how you envisioned it would be, and maybe in what ways, and whether you had a similar experience in Amge of over the course of the two weeks, feeling like you, you know, um, if going from being a privilege that you were there to really feeling like you had that right and that you were part of that process. Um, well, hopefully, I what uh, Namge said was right. It was such a privilege to be there. But then also, I really had, so last year I was at um, Glasgow and I really wanted to follow the negotiations last year, but because of COVID and other issues, I had no training, so I wasn't really allowed. So this year, I really had a mental picture of what it was going to be. I thought it was going to be one of those workshops where you sit around and talk and and then the training exposed me to how intense the process was and it prepared me for it. But then going there, entering the negotiation room was also a whole different, um, show you a whole different perspective. You realize that there are so many people there with so many different interests, even though we're, we've already spoken about that during the training. And then we realize, well, we are all there to kind of, promote what um, humanity is or to try to solve a common human problem. But then also everybody is there with their own interests, trying to make sure that the agendas of the various countries or the various um, whatever policies in their countries is represented. So it's a whole thing altogether. Sometimes it was very overwhelming, especially when it comes to debating texts that you think what's that you think, well, oh, shouldn't be a problem, but then it takes a whole day to just debate it. To be honest, um, I think first week into COP on the Friday, I got sick. I totally broke down because <laughs> I had not been having enough sleep rest. I woke up one full morning and my whole body was not going to allow me to get out of bed. My eyes were popping out, everything was. So I just had to take that Friday off. I decided that no, I'm going to take the day off. So I shut myself in and slept the whole day to have energy for the following week. But it was such um it was such an experience, you know. Um apart from it being a privilege, you also realize the responsibility that has been put on you. In my case, uh, the Ghana delegation was supposed to have the lead negotiator for lots and meet. And I think um, an underwhelming issue over the previous years, and nothing has kind of lost interest in it. And so I ended up finding myself at the helm of affairs when it comes to colors and damage. And that been my first time. I, it was really something. So the responsibility of it was huge. And uh, I'm really like happy that I got to do it with the CYMP team. And I had like a, a network of support in the negotiation room and it was really good. So yeah, that was my experience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for giving us, um, like that is a very interesting insight really into your personal experience that I know it was tough when you all, when you all turned up and there was, issues with accommodation and all things like that and then being sick on top of that as well must have meant that I know it's tiring being a negotiator without having all those having all those issues as well but um no that's really interesting to hear uh Alicia did you have anything that you wanted to add in terms of um what it was like being a negotiator I think the point about the responsibility on you when it feels real when you're really there is, is an interesting point and whether you have anything else to to add to that yeah, sure. So first of all, uh, I like to echo Namgay's comments because thanks to CYMP, I didn't feel 
uh, lost. Um, I mean, I felt lost, but in another way, but not like in the logistics of COB and how it works and how negotiations uh, kind of progress. So in that sense, I didn't feel, feel lost. But, but in regards to, for example, as you said, like the responsibility you have when you are there, um, I felt lost in the sense that, so for example, my, uh, in the case of my delegation, it was quite different as uh, the youth negotiators from Peru, we come from civil society. So this was like a call that the minister um, uh, launched uh, to, to join the CYMP and then the, the ones that were selected, including myself, we come from civil society, we are not public servants. So as per the protocol, we were not kind of allowed to speak on the on the negotiations and we had to be with a uh, uh, another public servant uh, from the ministry that was following uh, the topic. So, for example, the topics that I followed uh, was uh, together with another um, negotiator. Okay. We we call him like the senior negotiator. Uh, let's say it this way. So, um, I believe that I mean, and I say this because when you see uh, the negotiation rooms, it, it's mostly like uh, one country has one negotiator, and in in some cases they they might have two but you know they are always kind of like uh people that that, that maybe work for the minister of environment but not like the the figure in in our case was kind of different and it was like uh i felt like, like an intern that was following the uh the, the public servant and learning and it, it's important of course to learn and to and to listen carefully uh when it's your first cop and with and with the with the negotiation tracks that I have that were so well, well it was mitigation so it's always a, a complex topic and it's important for me to to first hear uh, oh, sorry listen and and learn uh, and see like the power dynamics within the room which was also another another issue because I I I didn't imagine like you see in the news like how geopolitics work, but once you're there and you see each countries like the Western countries, the BRICS countries like um, speaking to each other and, and putting on their uh, their interests, so it's like it's a bit overwhelming to see it happening like live, like in front of you, in front of you, and also realizing that you're part of a region that that needs to be united to put our interest across uh, because we are kind of competing with massive economic interest uh, at the same time. Um, I really like how other other regions as well uh, worked uh, together. For example, the IOSIS, which uh, is a is a negotiating group that I I really admire because they they have they are very knowledgeable. They put their advoc advocacy first. They and they of course are really pushing for more ambition. I really learned a lot from them too, and and also from ILAC. Um, uh, there were many experts in the in the groups, and I also felt like like the same. So I wasn't I wasn't like allowed to speak, but even if I could speak, I would listen first because they they were so experienced people, and they were speaking on on like all the I mean they have been to many cops, and they know how things work. They know how uh, okay let, let's uh, advocate for this language and maybe not this one because then they will not accept it, and then we will go into a mess. So let's better go this way so they it's it's good to like learn about how they define their strategies and um and yes yeah, so i believe this cup was uh, first of all for for learning at least uh, for myself um but but i think that it's also really important for young people uh, that are allowed to be negotiators to speak because many also there there was a case from from other countries also from from Latin America, that were uh, negotiators that were also part of like civil society, but were included as negotiators, and they could speak and also speak on behalf of their negotiating groups, of course, with previous coordination. Uh, but I believe it's important to uh, for us to give, for the delegations to give us that, that role because um, so I, I think that the idea is not that that they have like more negotiators but have young negotiators to push for more ambition. So it's kind of like an added value to that. Not just to have more negotiators because of the quantity, but have more like quality of ambition within the delegation. So it's important that for the next years, uh, delegations uh, have, if they have youth, youth negotiators, they give them more power, more responsibility, let them follow tracks on their own. Of course, first listening, consulting with the head of delegation, uh, consulting with the negotiating group, but like having the responsibility on their own and also having the um, the chance to speak as well and, and deliver the country's positions. That's a, a really interesting point about the role of the youth negotiator within the broader team. And I think taking into 
you know, consideration the fact that you do have to, you're working within a national agenda that in a way has been set for you. I think that's a really interesting point about how you can have that impact within that team. And also, you know, the impact that your own country is having within its, within its broader negotiating group means that there's so many overlapping motivations. And um, yeah, so it, it's, I completely agree that you kind of have to fight to have your ambition heard. And part of the reason that youth is in the room is to say like are there ways we can do this differently and, and to have new ideas and ambition before we move on to the next section I was wondering whether we could quickly go around and it really bounces off what Alicia has just said if you could each maybe give one tip or advice to um, someone hoping to become a youth negotiator or a potential youth negotiator next year how they can have that impact you know or something that you wish you'd known going in um, that you think would help them in that role uh, Evelyn if we come to you first So for me, I think my tip will be read and read and read and read and read because um, before you go, you just have to make sure that you are reading all the documents, really understand because you realize that when you enter the negotiation room, some of the decisions have been made, like they are quoting from previous, you know, court decisions and previous documents and all that. So you have to make time to really read all the UNFCCC documents that will be relevant to your your track or whatever you are going to follow. Um, just read a lot. And then because I got sick from not really taking care of myself in the first few days, really just um, try and take care of yourself. You have to learn how to balance it. Um, I mean, with me, my first few days, I was so excited. I wanted to be at every room every time just be there so i ended up breaking down and uh, at the end of the day you need to find a balance read but find a balance i think that would be my advice for anybody that wants to do it. two very good tips and hopefully us talking about the agreement today can be the basis of someone's learning for cop 28 but they'll know this agreement inside out hopefully by the end of today's chat Alicia, if we come to you next, and I think responding to what you've just said about how young people need to, you know, be bringing their ambition, I suppose as a young person, you can't always change the power dynamics that are above you. So as someone coming in, how, how can they, you know, push for their own thoughts and ideas to change, change the policy and agenda, which can feel very rigid? Sure. So on top of what Evelyn said, that first you have to be very knowledgeable on your topic. Also think, what are the things that young people are always advocating for, at, for example, at mitigation? What do we want? What uh, and how can I add this language to the negotiation? So maybe you you will need to go to COP with your objective set and of course speak it to your delegation beforehand. And first let it be kind of like your national position, like to put the, the youth, um, all the youth advocacy inside the national position and what are your aims in regards to language. And then uh, so, so, so that idea is that the delegation um, buys in all your all, all what what you have to bring uh, to the table, because you're representing your delegation. But first, you have to like bring it on your national position, and then when once it's there, uh, of course, work hard uh, in regards to that, and and be sure that. Uh, so now I believe in the in the following cups we will have more youth negotiators. So it's important to to know them, to meet them, uh, not only uh, inside the ones from the from the CYP, but there are also other programs. So like let, do do this networking so that we can have all kind of like a youth coalition at the negotiations and bring that the thoughts forward in the language. Yes, I suppose part of it is the numbers game the more young people there are the more that we can we can fight for these policies and uh completely agrees knowing it inside out and coming and being able to talk about these talk about these issues um that's actually a tip that mia motley was reiterating at the children and youth pavilion she said get conversational in these topics and then all the people know that you're knowledgeable uh namgate already such good tips given what 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 would you like to add um i think it really depends because you know i'm thinking that if the people present here today want to be negotiators, then in some countries, you strictly have to be working in the government. So you need to figure that out and get into the right places. But um, in, you know, the UNFCCC doesn't say that you have to be part of the government necessarily 
to be part of your country delegation, you can be part of civil society. Uh, you can also, you know, come in as a consultant. So it really is okay, uh, just so that um, our attendees here are aware. Um, if you do get to be part of the delegation or part of the negotiations, my tips would be, um, first, as Evelyn said, uh, good to have um, the your, your readings and your knowledge um, strong on the most pressing issues. So, you know, for most developing countries, for example, it would be adaptation, finance, carbon markets. But I'm also thinking another way that you can really add value would be to look at um, areas in which your countries necessarily wouldn't have um, a lot of current focus on. Uh, speaking from experience, I think it would be really good if um, the Bhutanis delegation, for example, started building expertise in um, health and climate or food systems, gender, ACE. Uh, so we have um, these big issues that we're very interested in that we want to work on, but I also see that there is a gap in these more niche issues. So this is one way that you can um, come in and also bring value. Then the last thing I would say is that, you know, being a negotiator, sounds very glamorous, but once you really get into it, um, I think it's um, much more difficult than that. Uh, you, There are people who have worked in this for years and years and years. And at the end of the day, it's, um, you know, it's not as you would expect. There's no flipping tables, people getting angsty. Um, in fact, it can get really boring and it stretches on and on and on. But what matters the most are the relationships that you are building then. And a lot of agreements don't come during the contact groups or the informals, you know, but it's during the informal informals. Um, it's a way when the camp, it, it happens when the cameras are off, when nobody is watching. So it's really that relationship building aspect that's important. And that requires a lot of commitment, resilience, patience and all that. So good luck to you if that's what you want to do. Oops, it seems as if we have lost Charlie momentarily. Uh, is that the case for others? Yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. Charlie's just stuck there. Oh. oh, and we've officially lost him. Okay. It's completely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I, I, I can take over temporarily uh, whilst Charlie makes his way back. Hopefully that's soon. Uh, thank you to the three of you for, for, for your advice and these tips. I'm sure if folks here are listening, uh, they know that... Um, it is not a glamorous job, but it is an extremely important job, and it can be very rewarding uh, uh, at, at the end of the day. Um, I think it might, right now might be a great time to hop on to the cover decision text uh, and to start maybe discussing uh, some, some of the key points. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Please let me know if you can't see it. Here we go. OK, can folks see this all right? Yes? Yes. OK, fantastic. Great. Just so. Um, apologies, folks. I'm just going to make a colleague uh, a co-host so she can, uh, Georgia, so she can let Charlie in when he is uh, present, as I cannot see the participants right now. Fantastic. OK. Um, so, folks, for those who haven't seen the cover text before, here it is, all 10 pages of it. Uh, Charlie and I have taken the time to highlight some things that we might we think might be important. Uh, but Namge, Alicia, and, and Evelyn, please feel free to uh, 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 hop in and, 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 and mention anything. Uh, we're going to go like uh, one highlight, one person, uh, more or less, just because there's a lot to go through. Um, so if you really, really want to add something uh, to, the, to the conversation, just say so. No worries. Just unmute yourself, as I cannot see all of you at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, why don't we get started? Um, Charlie and I thought that it was very interesting uh, that in the in the um, beginning text, uh, they highlighted and noted the importance of pursuing an approach to education, uh, which you can see right here, that promotes a shift in lifestyle whilst fostering patterns of development, sustainable, uh, oh, someone's here. Um, Evelyn, would you mind telling us um, uh, a little bit more about this? Charlie and I both thought it was very important to include education as there's a lot of initiatives happening around the world 
um, and thought it was very um, a really good sign to see this effectively right at the beginning of the cover decision. Um, it can be the other if anyone really uh, wants to speak about this. It doesn't have to be one specific person. Great. Um, yes. Um, so I agree. Um, the importance of pursuing an approach to education is really um, an important line in the cover decision. Education, climate education, as we all know, is really important. It's, it's important for everybody to really understand what's going on in our world, especially for people in developing countries to really get it and young children to get it. So I think that is that line is really important and also to continue education that promotes a shift in lifestyle. So it's not just telling people that climate change is happening, but also trying to come up with educational approaches that really changes the mindset of people on how they live every day to make sure that they are able to adapt a more sustainable lifestyle. It's, it's, it's an important thing. And um, I'm just hoping to see, waiting to see how that is carried out in most countries and how, especially as young people, how we can take advantage of that and start uh, coming up with initiatives that seek to promote sustainable lifestyle education or promote the adoption of sustainable lifestyle. And to add here, I have a blog that, <laughs> I don't know if it's the right place, but that um, seeks to educate people on sustainable lifestyle. So you can check it out. I haven't really updated it in a long time on Instagram. Oh, it's fantastic. called Sustainable Living Ghana. So just check it out and then. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Evelyn. If you don't I'm mind, if you don't mind. Myself right now. <laughs> That's okay. If you don't mind uh, putting a link. Um, in it's just Sustainable chat. Living Ghana. Sure. All right, I'll do that. Um, so you, yes, Evelyn. I think that is very important. Um, yeah, and I, I, and I, let, I um, Namge or... yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think I think uh, it's extremely important, and and also for people to understand that it's not just the youth that needs to educate, be educated, right? We've been uh, told that things must be one way for so long that even senior folks, middle aged folks, uh, also need help in in understanding ways that they can live more sustainably and the impact of the actions that they can take. Um, the next uh, bit of highlight, uh, highlighted text that we had, uh, we were wondering if, if one of the three, maybe Namge, you could give us a, uh, just a quick definition and the importance uh, of, of why, oh, not definition, sorry, it was a different section. Um, but this, this section that alludes to human rights uh, and, and why it's so important to include something like this at the beginning of the cover uh, decision when talking about climate change. Uh, yeah, I find it quite interesting that um, the phrase human rights uh, made it into the cover decision. I think um, that's a good thing. And I say I find it surprising because uh, it is usually quite contentious for the word human rights um, to be used in many different contexts. And, you know, um, I completely do believe that um, climate justice and and uh, the impacts of climate change are a matter of um, human rights, but I think this can be sensitive to many countries, um, and you know, for for many complex uh, complex historical historical or political um, reasons. But I think what this indicates is that now we need to uh, have a different notion of what human rights is, because, uh, you know, in many ways, I think uh, when you say human rights, then it conjures up images of like, you know, war and uh, civil strife. Um, but the climate crisis is now going to cause um, displacement of people from um, where they're usually living or, uh, or, or wars over resources, right? And as you can see in the next line, then there's a conversation on food security that has come up quite uh, strongly this time around. Um, so yeah, that that is what um, that would be my reaction to seeing these lines. Thank you, Namge. I, I I appreciate that, and and it is very uh, important to recognize that it can be very politicized uh, and used as a tool of of, of manipulation. Uh, you know who is not respecting human rights, who isn't. 
uh, etc. But at least the way it's defined here, if we look later, just you know, to a healthy and sustainable environment, the right to health, rights of indigenous peoples, etc., uh, which does make it uh, um, a lot clearer. Alicia, did you want to add anything? I saw you unmuted yourself. Yes, yes, actually, uh, I think it's really, really important, especially this part that says the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment because it addresses inequities. So, um, so for instance, we know that many um, unhealthy and sustainable environments are mostly reserved for like the, the most vulnerable communities, poor peoples, for example, indigenous communities that suffer from oil spills each year, each month even. Uh, whereas the, the richest people that are polluting more the environment, they, they kind of live in a very clean and healthy environment. So it's like, uh, it, it's a matter also of addressing inequities. And I believe this is also, this also has potential for uh, planetary health. Uh, so this is um, the discipline that addresses not only the health of the human being, but also the health of the environment of the, of the earth as a whole. Uh, so, uh, as a, as a very important issue to, to have health for all, literally for all the, the living beings, as we are part of a more complex, um, we are part of a complex system, not only just humans and then the earth, but it's like humans are part of everything. Yeah. So it, it's important to also have that in mind. It's, it's a really big win. In, and also the right to health, because, you know, as, as we have, I, I don't know if we have discussed this before, but um, climate change and health is a topic that is not, it, it's not negotiated, but it should be because it has also a lot of potential to, to push for more ambition uh, as climate change is, is going to kill a lot of people, millions of people in the, in the years to come. So this, the right to health, to put it in here, I believe it's a starting point for, um, for pushing more and more ambition in, in the health area. And if, sorry, if I can add to, especially the human rights aspect, um, within the, let me say AGN or within the Canadian delegation, you realize that when the issue of human rights came out as a, as a topic for the negotiations, everybody was very suspicious. And living in a country where the rights of um, homosexuals and maybe gay people are like a taboo topic. I, I remember one of our lead negotiators coming to me and saying, do you know they are trying to put in um, human rights, which will mean that uh, we have to consider gay people. And I was like, so what is your fear, you know? Um, <laughs> But it's also, in the, I don't know if it's all the different countries, but within the AGN, for example, people were really suspicious about the agenda for human rights in the climate discourse. But I also think it's a very important decision that that uh, human rights was been. And I'm hoping that maybe with time, we would have a more detailed discussion on that and how climate change is affecting people um, differently, especially when it comes to, even when it comes to developing where people, gays and um, homosexuals, uh, their rights are really not considered at all. So it was, it was really something, you know, I don't think, I think a lot of people from the AGN and DSM-7 were not really happy with that, with that text. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really, um, insightful point from actually being in the negotiations room as well how so often the negotiations are coming down to you're literally talking about one or two words that can stall the negotiations for such long periods and I think with the ACE negotiations the word like intersectional or intersectionality was um being negotiated for such a long period as well I think for similar reasons like some countries thought there was like an element a sexuality element to that um which is interesting uh side to multilateral negotiations that countries are coming with really different just perspectives on on issues that affect everyone but um it's interesting to see how that plays out um yeah i think we can yeah if we move on to page two i think this paragraph on the end of the recital is really interesting as well the one that talks about um 
like stressing the increasingly complex and challenging global geopolitical situation. I think this kind of actually touches on something that Alicia was mentioning before about how you really feel the geopolitics in the room. I mean, maybe one of the negotiators is better to speak on that, but it really is like from watching like countries that are in the same negotiating groups or have close ties in real life sit together in the room. Is that right? Yeah, so like the groups of countries, kind of like you see how the Western countries align and set themselves, push for one thing. We know that in another room, they're pushing for totally the opposite thing, uh, but also the BRICS countries that have also similar interests, they kind of like make this kind of balances of, of big powers. But then we, there's the the, the, other, uh, the goals of countries that we don't have as much power as compared to these big economies. Uh, so it's like, uh, I believe that in that in that case, it's a matter of building unity to to cope with that. Yeah, and I think just like building on that as well, it really felt like to me, not even just in the negotiation room, but across the whole conference, ongoing geopolitical situations really it's like a microcosm for them like, um, for example, the war in Ukraine was a big talking point for everyone at the conference. And how that would impact whether a, an agreement could be reached um and also coming up in just like side events like because this is an agreement between all countries the sort of main issues that all countries are facing it's it's impossible to have these discussions without reflecting on that as well and without that being really impacting um the sort of text that you can agree on and, and the policies that can everyone can get behind Okay. Uh, so the next point is on science and urgency. And um, this is actually one of the few places that we see 1.5 degrees mentioned in the whole agreement, which I know was a really big talking point um, at this COP, whether we were going to get that reiterated, that we need to stick to that 1.5 degree target. This is something that the G20 was making a really big point at um, during the second week of COP as the two summits were going on at the same time. Um, would JP or any, or any of the negotiators like to talk a little bit about why 1.5 was so contentious or if they had heard from around the conference, which countries were pushing for that or against it? Um, I'd like to jump in quickly. Uh, so for those of you who, who are reading this for the first time, um, I would suggest going a couple of steps back so the way you look at this document right is that in the beginning you see sort of like the preambular text and that's really setting the context so um, it's really great that um, Charlie and JP you have highlighted the key points but you know those are more um, declarations then as you go down on the second page onwards you see point like section one two three so this is where the meat of the document actually is and this is where um the actual action and the things that are that we're going to do around the topics will be mentioned so just wanted to put that out before we go into the discussion and um yeah if anyone would like to give an overview of the science and the urgency i'm happy to pass on the stage i i can have uh so some comments on that i something that amazed me well or surprised me during the negotiations was that when we discussed some of the ipc things um that well that stress the the level of urgency and on all the concerns some countries were kind of unhappy with that because that revealed their lack of action and they weren't keen on including it on the text like the ipcc some of the ipcc findings so uh, I, I that surprised me because it's like we are speaking about science i remember also in the negotiation i will mention the, the names of the countries but some country was like saying, I don't want this language on the, on the APCC here. And another country said, like, we are talking about science. Are you denying it? <laughs> and it was like, wow. <laughs> so, so yeah, because it's like, uh, it's science is, is subjectively saying what, like the, the path we are in and how bad we are going. And, and it's also surprising to see that, for example, uh, you know, that the Paris Agreement uh, says uh, two degrees and also 1.5, ideally 1.5. And when we wrote on the text only 1.5 and not two, some countries would already 
are they like, why don't we add two? It's part of the Paris Agreement. We have to stick to the Paris Agreement. It's like, okay, we understand it's on the Paris. Uh, this is my personal opinion. So it's like, we know that it's part of the Paris Agreement, the, the two degrees, but we need to push for 1.5 because otherwise like the difference between 1.5 and two is the death of millions of people, the loss of different ecosystems. So it's like, it's, I, I know that this has to do with their economic interest and the oil production and all of that, but we're talking about about lives. So it's like, that, that would be something I would have liked to, to say and to speak, but it's like, um, it, it really surprised me a lot because I don't know if they are being, uh, I mean, not to speak about the, the, the negotiators themselves, but like the position of their country, the politics of their country. I don't know if they're aware what we are, what we're speaking about the, the because like the world is going to be very different uh, between 1.5 or two. And if, okay, it's okay that two is in the Paris Agreement, but we should aim for 1.5 period. <laughs> so yeah, that was very frustrating to hear. Yeah, I think it is sometimes the case that when you have um, like uh, big policies at certain COPs, people become too obsessed with maybe like maintaining the line because that's something that they've been happy with. Well, obviously the urgency of the climate crisis means that every year we need to really be <laughs> jumping up and escalating the type of action that we're willing to take. And it can't be the case that, you know, years on from Paris, we're still okay with two degrees and ideally 1.5, like you're, like you're saying, we're learning more. You know, the science is telling us more about how bad that situation is going to be. And we, and we need to be reacting to that rather than just maintaining the status quo. But I suppose it's kind of there's an analogy there with the, the coronavirus pandemic and the way that that science was, has been manipulated and conspiracy theories, etc. The way that it's so important that we're able to look at objective science and all agree that, you know, that is that is an objective fact. And that needs to be the basis of our policies rather than it being twisted and, you know, welcome and recognize and all these words that sort of give vague meaning and it's not clear whether everyone is agreed on, on the urgency of the situation uh, i don't know if anyone else has any points on science and urgency or we can move on also i will say for anyone um who's watching please do raise your hand or ask questions as we move through. Or I, I know I see some names of people who are also very active in the climate space. So please hop on if you have something that you want to add or some thoughts on any part of the agreement. I just wanted to say we didn't highlight anything on uh, uh, sections two or three, but um, if the panelists have anything to say, please, please do so. Um, I'll jump in. So I was thinking about how to bring in the article six um, in the cover decision because it's not explicitly mentioned anywhere. And this is in contrast to the Glasgow Climate Pact where you have like this huge solid decision on what is to be done. Um, but I thought of making the connection here in section two actually on uh, enhancing ambition and implementation. And these two phases are actually really, really important in the context of the Article 6. So maybe um, I will speak a little bit more here. And then, you know, in the next sections, I will not speak so much because, to be frank, I remain quite ignorant and because I haven't been able to follow anything else at the COP. Uh, so uh, ambition and implementation. Um, to start with a bit of history, um, the Article 6 is the only um, article in the Paris Agreement that enables international cooperation in the form of countries being able to internationally transfer their mitigation outcomes. And this necessarily alludes to market mechanisms. So you trade carbon credits, right? So you have Article 6.2 that talks about um, bilateral, multilateral, plurilateral cooperation between countries to trade carbon credits. Um, and this is viewed to be more decentralized. It's left up to the parties completely on how they want to do it. And um, Article 6.4 focuses on a much more centralized voluntary carbon markets now. And 
you may know that carbon markets have existed since the Kyoto Protocol, and they mostly came into existence when countries like the USA and Canada refused to ratify it or be part of the Kyoto Protocol. So the voluntary carbon market sort of came up in a parallel universe to enable that. But now under the Paris Agreement, the idea is to bring it under the supervision and regulation of the supervisory body. And again, in both 6.2, 6.4, a lot of things are up in the air. Um, but what we have been able to do this time around, and um, a lot was achieved actually during the last COP in Glasgow, because up until then, for years and years, negotiations had completely stalled. And at the COP26, uh, countries could finally agree on, you know, some sort of, so it's called the rules, modalities and procedures, right? So this is the implementation part of the Article 6. It has been there since the Paris Agreement came into existence, but it is only now that we are going ahead and implementing it. And this is a big um, deal for many parties. But again, um, it could be said that we still need to figure out a lot of things in in the sense of uh, you know really defining what we mean but when we say certain things so you know for example what do we really mean by carbon removal right so that is currently what is being debated as well um, and ultimately the point is to and you must have heard this but it's not to just pass around these um, mitigation outcomes but really to enhance ambition and this keeps coming up again and again in the Article 6 discussion. But, you know, what do we really mean by enhancing ambition? Does it mean adaptation? Does it mean mitigation? So these are all things that you can really be critical about in the whole conversation. And finally, um, I also want to bring attention to Article 6.8 that talks about non-market mechanisms, non-market approaches. Um, so broadly defined, it means how countries can cooperate with each other and contribute to each other's um, nationally determined contributions, NDCs. Um, but the, the elephant in the room here is nobody really knows what NMAs, what non-market approaches mean, other than the fact that, yeah, we're supposed to help each other out in our NDCs, um, but then, you know, what sort of activities um, are we talking about? And, you know, how do we, um, how do we define an enemy? So what has been decided uh, in the COP27 is that we're going to come up with a web-based web platform and countries will be allowed to make submissions on what they think is a non-market approach. Um, so it doesn't involve like financial transactions, but there is still contributing to each other's as NDCs. And a lot of developing countries have also said that, you know, we just don't want this to be a parking lot of ideas, but we want it to have like a matching feature that then allows um, countries to speak to each other. And then, you know, if um, there is something complementary or if um, two, two or more initiatives can work together, uh, that the web-based platform would uh, match these parties and then allow for further cooperation. And what next? Uh, there will be more meetings throughout the year to really hash these things out. Going back to 6.2 and 6.4, uh, you know, the format of the reporting and the registries have been decided. And again, there is a lot of work that needs to be done in order to actually like create it into systems that countries are going to be able to use. So I think all that is reflected in point number two on enhancing ambition and finally implementing article six. And so you see things like, you know, uh, objectives of the convention, the Kyoto Protocol is also mentioned because uh, the Kyoto Protocol more or less is dead and we have to transfer um, the 
credits from the Kyoto Protocol into the Paris mechanism. And that was also another big topic that was agreed. So the timeline was agreed. Uh, the type of project were also the types of project that would qualify to be translated from the Kyoto to the Paris Agreement were also agreed. And again, parties are going to meet throughout the year and then hash all these things out. And this is basically a summary of the Article 6 conversations and debates that happened this time around. And I'll stop talking here. <laughs> Thank you for that update, Namge, on Article 6. I had noted when we were doing our preparation for this, that Article 6 is not mentioned explicitly at all in the agreement. And uh, it's so fundamental to the success of the Paris Agreement and international cooperation. So thank you for going through 6.2, 6.4, 6.8 so well and explaining those elements. I really find it interesting. Um, you're saying about the non-market approaches and how that vague term is such a defining that is such a key part of the negotiations. And um, I feel like that there are so many parts of the agreement that I like that where you see terms and you just there's no clue what that means in practice. And uh, it's such a part of the COP process that you just everyone needs to agree on a very vague term as the first step. And then hopefully the next COP or the COP after you can turn it into something meaningful, which is very slow. But I suppose that's multilateral agreements. Um, if no one has anything else to say about um, enhancing ambition implementation, we can move on to energy and mitigation. Um, I'm assuming Alicia is going to have some ideas about this section as Alicia was negotiating mitigation. Um, but I suppose the big point here is that there was discussion about getting wording in about phasing down fossil fuels that we didn't end up getting into the final agreement. We stuck on phase down to unabated coal power and phase out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, which was wording that was agreed at Glasgow. Um, Alicia, if I pass over to you to maybe give us some insight into why we didn't move beyond this. Um, I know you don't want to mention specific countries, but maybe some of the, the talks and the, and the debates that were going on. Yeah, sure. So, well, it's clear that countries are, are trying to safeguard your own interests and economic activities. Um, and also for this, uh, for this approach to mitigation, they rely, uh, rely upon uh, some principles of the Paris Agreement, such as equity uh, or reflecting common but differentiated responsibility for responsibilities and respective capabilities in the light of different national circumstances. So these, these phrases are very, very important for some countries because um, especially the, the, the countries that, um, that kind of have more, more emissions but are still, are still considered as developing countries because that uh, basically gives more responsibility to the developed countries that historically and, and also until now are emitting more, most of the greenhouse gas emissions. But it's like kind of like shift in these responsibilities uh, because of these principles of the Paris Agreement. Um, there was also an intention to, I remember an intention to put the, the, word, the wording of uh, highest emitting economies or countries, something like that, like highest emitting uh, uh, countries. But this, this was refused, uh, strongly refused by some countries. Um, uh, and, and they explained and they like came back to these uh, principles, equity and, and CBDR, CBDR, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> we, we, we can think of, of some of them, <laughs> uh, uh, some of these countries. But yes, um, so it's like, I find it like, it's kind of shifting the responsibilities. I, I believe really that all the countries that are emitting the most being there, being there developed or developing countries should have uh, a strong responsibility on mitigation. But well, but well, apart from that, in regards to the phase dam of innovated coal power and phase out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. So yes, uh, as Charlie mentioned, the, the main issue here was that we are not including oil and gas, uh, like we are not including all fossil fuels. I believe, because I was like, I wasn't in the negotiations of the cover text and of, or end of this, and of this phrasing, but I believe that it's because of the economic interests of some countries that are producing oil. Um, and it's like, uh, and it's really, uh, it's really frustrating because the idea is to have, is to have more ambition in, in each COP. And in comparison to Glasgow, this hasn't been the case. So there's not, this is not a better outcome than in Glasgow. 
And also there's something that is not highlighted, but it's here that uh, low emission energy systems. So this was also something I read in some newsletter that this can uh, bring the possibility of including other sources of energy, such as nuclear energy that are not the best ones because they, you know, nuclear energy has also nuclear waste, which is very dangerous. But, um, but, but, but yeah, it's, it, it, this phrase kind of gives the possibility to, to, to build up on, on nuclear energy and other low emission energy systems. So it's kind of big, but nuclear energy can enter in this. So it's like also a bit concerning uh, in my personal opinion. Um, and yeah, I think, I think I'll pass on to someone else who wants to jump in. Thank you for highlighting that low emission energy systems. That's a really interesting point that I think we had skipped over. Uh, Namge, Evelyn, I'm not sure if you, Either of you want to jump in on this section and add anything. Um, I will also say that we are running slightly over. I think we will probably end up running to about half four, but the conversation's too yeah. interesting. I don't wanna um <laughs> I don't want to cut this short. Um I will actually ask a quick question on the follow-up to um Alicia's comments on mitigation, which is to all the negotiators. I'm aware that you guys are very diplomatic and you don't mention which countries are are um you know, stalling negotiations. Um, but that is generally, it will be in the news, it'll be in the media, it'll be spoken around COP, people will be mentioning specific countries that are blocking negotiations. Do you think that is helpful um, to be mentioning specific countries in the sense that it puts a lot of pressure on them? Or do you think it makes the process quite adversarial when people feel targeted or that they're being blamed and shamed? Um. <laughs> I have to answer that. Um, I think it goes. Hello. We can hear. You. Yeah. If you country um, that they were blocking um, the negotiations, then it's like you are shaming them. But next time. But also in the spirit of diplomacy, I don't think it's really okay sometimes to also bring out some of these things because um, you want people to be able to feel free to come to the negotiation room with open minded, able to speak freely and um, not really try to get anybody into silence. Because if if you do, what about, I mean, if I'm going to speak or speak my mind in a negotiation and you are going out to shame me later on, I think, but behind the scene, if I have the power, I will try and solve things behind the scene, the scene but you end up shaming someone. So it both ways, it can be useful if we name them, but it, it can also be very association process. So I, I think that it's better that before COP, um, we all try to come up with some sort of, uh, I don't know how to say, but just come up, put humanity at the center of our, our negotiations. And when that is done, I think all this stalling and trying to really strictly stick to countries' interests will, will go down. And that's why I'm really excited and happy that we have a lot of young people now in the negotiation rooms that seems to have very common interests and really want to see the issues of climate change um, resolved and people who are having challenges um, being sorted out. So that this whole sticking strictly to your your country uh, position will go down and that we can even influence our country's position even before we enter the negotiation room and that will make things way way more easier but naming and shaming will not really help the diplomatic process that's my opinion that's uh yeah alicia will will come to you if you want to add to that <laughs> yes uh i just wanted to jump in because i believe that uh, I'm not naming the countries because it's like I'm still stuck in my head with this uh, these norms at the UN that inside COP you cannot name countries. But I, I believe that as civil society people, we need to name them. We need to know the why 
and, and how and what's like the opinion of civil society in those countries in regards to that. Uh, side events are very useful for that. For example, um, one of these countries that was blocking a lot of the negotiations, I remember I went to a side event that one of the a representative of a uh, civil side of that country was kind of uh, a bit like um, understanding the position of the country in regards to like, this is our main, uh, our economy or all of our economy is dependent on this, on all the production. So if we go down on this totally, many people are going not to have healthcare, education, uh, but also it's equally important to, to start to think on renewables, on, on, liter on now um, building capacity on, uh, on, on moving to renewables. So it's also interesting to hear like civil society from these countries and their active roles in this. Uh, but also I think that when you, when civil society starts naming the countries, it can, it can be used by, because you know, they're kind of, we are living in a multipolar world and one side of the, <laughs> of the powers can say, oh, um, this one is responsible for that. And like use it as, as, part, as part of their geopolitical strategies and kind of shifting all the conversation. So we see a lot of this with, okay, for example, with China and the USA. So it's like, um, it, it's important to name it and to, uh, and to know what's happening in these countries. Uh, but also we, ha we have to be warned that the other, other responsibles on cl of climate change, the others, high emitters, uh, do not use this advocacy of civil society for their own interests and own geopolitical strategies, and also to 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 move the agenda and, and place the uh, and place other countries in the spotlight when they also have the same responsibility on this. You know, you know what I mean with this. It's like uh, they they kind of using the advocacy of civil society to to kind of shift the attention to other countries, but not to them. But they are also responsible. So that's something uh, we should also be aware of. And like naming all the responsible, all the responsible countries, and and understanding what are their interests and how to overcome it. And also not only name it, but also uh, thinking of uh, possible solutions of possible. Um, I don't know. Like we need to be creative in this. But it's like not only like protesting, but also proposing solutions on that. Yeah, I think that you've both given very interesting perspectives on the answer to that question. And I particularly like your point, um, Alicia, on how, uh, like when you went to that side event and heard that their side of the argument, you know, whichever country that was that example on why they feel that way. And I feel like you lose a lot of the nuance when you're just blaming countries without, you know, giving the perspective that often there's reasons behind it that they're trying to protect their economy or trying to protect um, things that are important to their their country and that is part of the conversation that needs to be respected in the interest of time I think we'll move on um, to the next section so adaptation um, which I think we'll all agree is extremely important I don't know it wasn't um, even though it was a big focus of this year's COP not a great deal of progress was made would anyone like to talk or mention anything about adaptation before we go into loss and damage Yeah, um, you know, when I think when we talk about adaptation, it ultimately leads to um, the finance aspect of it, which is in section. So in the interest of time, I think it will be helpful to look at it. Um, section nine. So you have finance. I don't know, Charlie, if you have highlighted anything there. We have, yeah. Um, the 20 billion USD a year goal um, utterly failed to materialize, which um, was a promise made. I'm not sure in which uh, COP that, uh, you know, by 2020, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, developed countries would commit 20, is it 20? 20, 20, it, it was 100 billion. It was 100, sorry, yeah. uh, 100 billion, million per year billion, uh, yeah. to climate finance. And then uh, this time around, there is the new global goal. And then, you know, I think it's brought up here in the finance section. Um, so basically what they did last year was they said, oh, we failed, but, uh, you know, let's just try to increase our ambition and then have this new goal. 
so that's there. I think um, the positions of developing countries, it's very clear. Uh, it's a resounding um, uh, need for more funding that has to be directed to adaptation. Um, and again, this is uh, related to then the conversation on loss and damage, which uh, is beyond adaptation, but we're still struggling quite a bit in terms of the resource flow, even for adaptation, uh, which disproportionately impacts uh, the most vulnerable, but also those that do not have the capabilities to deal with. Um, so, you know, I think the conversation here is a bit bleak. I mean, there is the new global goal, but um, other than the statements, uh, there is a lot that we still have to study. Um, in terms of the flows of finance, how much is going out, um, where it's going. And I think um, there is a uh, bias for bilateral arrangements in terms of the finance, climate finance flows, uh, rather than, you know, bigger commitments made to multilateral um, instruments, um, such as the Global Environment Facility. So all that is there. Um, and yeah, if Evelyn or Alicia would like to add anything else. I think if we, uh, I'm, I'm just conscious we don't have much time left. Thank you for, for those comments. I completely agree that, that finance and adaptation is so intertwined um, that really any progress and adaptation is so reliant on us making progress in finance too. Um, I was wondering, Evelyn, Evelyn, as you were tracking loss and damage, whether you'd be able to give us um, some insight into this section. This was one of the big achievements of this COP that we had this loss and damage fund. Maybe if you could start for people who might not be familiar by reminding us what loss and damage is and then the significance of the parties agreeing to this loss and damage fund this year. Okay. Um... So, um, loss and damage, I think Namgi actually also mentioned it, um, uh, some of the impacts of climate change that goes beyond adaptive, how climate change is affected already in their livelihoods, they are losing it's affecting people's economic countries and uh, with issues simply by mitigating or by adapt. So that's basically what loss and damage is. The issue of loss and damage has been a conversation for a while, but never. really been given from an sponsor into the negotiation table decisions were made um first time in Glasgow acknowledge that and that it's hard on some economies they said Evelyn, I think we might have missed. Um, no. I think we might have missed the end of what you were saying there because um, of the signal. I'm not sure if it's better now. Um, yeah, you. I. It might be better if you turn off your videos. Well, sometimes that helps the internet um, connection. Can you hear me now? Uh, it's still a bit shaky. Hello. Can you hear me now? We can, but it's a bit shaky. Maybe if, if you turn off your video, sometimes it helps yeah. your internet connection. I was just trying to play for a lot of languages. But um, when it came to seven, I actually have 10 of my video. Okay, now. 
Yes, that's better. Hello? Okay. Yeah, so when it came to COP27, there were three key things on the agenda for loss and damage. And one was on the um, Warsaw International Mechanism um, Executive Committee report. Hello? Yeah, Hi. we can hear you. Okay. So, um, so there were three things. Um, the executive um, report from the ESCOM, and then that was quite easy because that was accepted by all parties. Uh, the ESCOM now have, we, um, it was um, agreed that they can roll out their second action plan, which is a five-year plan. And then there was the operationalization of the Santiago network, how to set up a structure that will make sure that the Santiago network becomes fully operational and then loss and damage finance. With the operationalization of the Santiago network, there was a little bit of, everybody agreed that it was really important for it to become operational and everybody agreed that it was urgent. But then when it came to the structure, there was a little bit of disagreement as to how the structure is going to structure, how is that is it going to have an advisory body? Is it going to how is it going to work? But finally it was um agreed that the Santiago network is going to have an advisory board and then a hosted um secretariat. And we developed in the agreement, we developed a criteria for selection of the secretariat, and then there was um, a, um, a criteria also developed for this, how the secretariat is going to work. And then um, also how the, the, the Santiago network is going to be funded. So the agreement was that developed countries are going to fund the work of the Santiago network. The one of the key disagreement was whether to make the Santiago network, um, the secretariat especially, a, a wanted a very lean a developing country. So it was there was a trade-off where developed countries were able to have their lean secretariat and developing countries were able to argue for an advisory board which is more inclusive and balanced. So we are going to have an advisory board, then a secretariat, and then a host organization. And it was also so agreed that developed countries funded. So that was the agreement when key agreement when it comes to the Santiago network. On the loss and damage finance, I, I think that was really interesting trying to say to as to establish everybody had a position. I think one of the key concerns with the developed countries how to establish a fund when there are other things as is of some of the issues when it comes to climate change. But um, developed countries, developing countries insisted that it's really important to separate loss and damage from all the other areas and have a dedicated fund where countries, especially developing countries, can go in and assess funding. So after a whole lot of negotiations, it was agreed that they are going to we are going to set up a fund dedicated to loss and damage. Um, and then to make sure that the fund is fully established, one of the key things that was agreed on was the establishment of a transitional committee that we see to it, see to the mobilization of funding into, into the fund that was established. And then modalities for the work of the transitional committee was also set up in the agreement. And then, but my, the part that I really wasn't happy about when it comes to loss and damage finance was that it did not, um, I don't know if you can hear me, but it did not categorically say that developed countries are supposed to put money into their fund. You know, um, when it comes to the Santiago network, 
it was stated there that developed countries are supposed to put uh, um, fund the work of the Santiago Network. But when it comes to the fund that was established for loss and damage finance, let me see, it wasn't really, it was, I want to read that part. Um, I have it here and it says that developed country parties, the operating entities of the financial mechanism, United Nations entities and intergovernmental organization and other bilaterals and multilateral institutions, including non-governmental organizations and private sectors are urged to provide enhanced and additional support for activities addressing loss and damage. And, and it goes on, right? So when you say, I mean, it's quite, I think that that language is quite weak because it doesn't really explicitly say how is the money going to be put in, who is supposed to put in the money. I mean, it's quite weak. And I, I'm, I'm hoping that COP28, because the transitional committee is also going to now start it to work, I'm sure all of these modalities will will come to play. And I'm hoping that when we go to COP28, negotiations on loss and damage, especially loss and damage finance, make sure that we make sure that we get a clear picture on who is supposed to fund loss and damage. Because I think that the language in this current decision is quite weak. And that's what I wanted to say about that. I that is so great to hear. Um, I'm so glad that we were managed to get a strong enough signal for you to give us those insights, Evelyn, because that was so great to hear. I know that you, um, well, we all know that you were following loss and damage, and that's such a key part of this year's COP. And you touched on so many interesting points, um, especially in relation to the Santiago Network, which I think for those that don't know is definitely worth looking into further and worth and worth reading about. That's a really interesting um, element to loss and damage. I'm so conscious um, that we're nearly out of time. So I think we are gonna skip forward a bit. Um, finance we've touched on a bit. So unfortunately we're gonna have to move past that. Everything in the agreement is so important. So it's it's hard to skip forward too much, but I um, want to next go on to uh, capacity building and taking stock, which both only get one paragraph each. And because we only have about five minutes left, um, these are two topics which are very hard to summarize succinctly but if i could ask one of the negotiators to give us maybe a definition of capacity building and why it's important in about a minute that that would be really great um maybe namge um okay oops very unfortunate okay. timing uh oh. Oh, what happened? Oh, now oh, we, we hear you. We can hear you now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we can hear you now. Although maybe you might want to turn off your video too. That will help you. Or it might help the internet connection. Oh, okay. Not, oh, okay. All right. How is it now? It's all good now. Is this better? Okay, uh, so stock taking, a uh, big agenda again this time around. So this is basically on the implementation of uh, the, the UNFCCC treaty and also the Paris Agreement. So where we are at uh, in terms of our efforts, um, if you... Namge, I think we might have lost you again. Um... While we're waiting for Namgay to come back, Alicia, if we pass um, on to you, if you could maybe step in. I know you were doing so, uh, taking stock or you were involved with that. So maybe you could give us a, a one minute overview of what taking stock is and um, why it's important. Yes, so I can see here the deal also mentions a second periodic review on the long term global goal. Um, yeah, so what I understand here is that so we have the global stock take that is going to take place. I mean, there has been there has been a round tables uh, this year, um, but next year it's supposed next COVID is supposed to have this evaluation of the of the latest, and 
NDCs, NDCs. And, and well, it's, it's clear that we are not on track uh, for our commitments of the Paris Agreement, but the idea of also for the Global Stock Day is to have new recommendations and what's the way forward. And on top of that, we also have the second periodic review, which is like uh, another mechanism to kind of review not only the NDCs, but also the um, uh oh i don't i don't know if namge is online no uh but we'll maybe I can just briefly say no, no, that it's fine at least you your carry on <laughs> yeah okay. Yes, so just to add that like, the second periodic review, uh, the idea is to collect the data and, and evaluate uh, not only the NDCs, but also the scientific uh, the scientific area, like have, have all the inputs in place to also um, add, be, be complementary to the global stock take and define a way forward. So it's it's very important because it's like an, an evaluation. It's it's to evaluate the progress done so far that we know it's not it's not uh, enough, but like, how could we improve it? Um, yeah, I don't know if Namgui wants to jump in again. I think Namgei is typing her response. So we'll be able to see that in a second. Um, and now, thank you so much for summarizing that, Alicia. I'm so sorry that we have to skip forward again, but we'll just go to the very final article which is um, enhancing implementation action by non-party stakeholders. Um, and I just wanted to highlight something really specific in this section, which is all about um, the role that civil society have and different groups that have traditionally been excluded from climate policy making, such as youth, women, um, indigenous peoples, disabled peoples. Um, so it's really crucial that we have this section on how we can improve it and make climate policy more inclusive. And as um, Climate Talk is a youth negotiation, and we have the amazing climate youth negotiators here with us, I think it's worth highlighting that youth has been, uh, been able to play a massive part this year in this um, article of the agreement that there are three paragraphs on youth, which are focusing on making sure that you young people and children have a role in climate decision making. There's um, also a paragraph on making sure that the outcomes of the conference on youth um, are being noted by uh, stakeholders, which is really important as well, because that global policy statement that comes out of the Conference of Youth is a really crucial way that young people are able to get their input into uh, COP and generally global climate policy. Uh, so I'm really glad that we were able to touch on the main topics uh, or the main achievements or exclusions from the agreement today. Thank you for the people that are still hanging on. I know that we went a bit over. <laughs> And we appreciate your dedication to this very, very important topic. Um, Namge has just put some more thoughts in the chat. So please check that out, um, because I know that's going to be as uh, interesting as, as all the comments we've heard today. Um, I hope that everyone has learned something new about the agreement. I think sometimes we get so focused on COP and everything that's happened during COP that sometimes we forget to actually look at the final agreement that comes out and um, the exact wording of that, which is very, very crucial. And it's what the negotiators here and so many other negotiators from around the world work really, really hard to get out. So I'm glad that we had the chance to review it all together. And here's some really great insights from those up there. Thank you, Georgia. I'm glad that you <laughs> were able to learn lots from our discussion today. And I hope that everyone did. Um, I'm not sure if JP, you have any uh, no, I, I just wanted to reiterate that. Thank you so much, Alicia. Thank you, Namgay, and thank you, Evelyn, for your thoughts, contributions, and and uh, like uh, Julia said, for for representing youth at uh, at COP, something that is so needed and so much more needed in the future. We appreciate your time, and uh, for folks attending, uh, let us know what you liked about this or what you didn't like. Uh, feel free to hit us up on Instagram or or, or Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc., uh, and keep your eyes peeled for other events that we might be hosting in the future. Thanks for yes, attending. Yes, good events coming. <laughs> and hopefully a slightly more time-managed events <laughs> from mine and JP's side. 